Please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This morning we will begin verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 to 25. The uh, title for this morning's sermon is The Foolishness of Preaching Christ Crucified. It's a little wordier than I wanted it to be, um, but it didn't seem complete to just say the folly of preaching, and it didn't seem complete to just say Christ crucified, or we preach Christ crucified. Um, so it is what it is. While I was preparing for this sermon, a sermon which denounces eloquent wisdom, I made the mistake of reading Charles Spurgeon's sermon on this passage. And uh, for the next about four hours, I sat and stared at my screen, unable to write anything, because uh, Spurgeon is extremely eloquent, even while he's denouncing eloquent wisdom. Um, and uh, you find yourself thinking, you know, what, what can I write compared to what Spurgeon's already written and said about this? And then to make it even worse, I looked at the date on which he preached it, and he was 21 years old when he preached this sermon. That was just, just wonderful. Um, but I did eventually recover. Um, I was able to complete the sermon. Um, I, I was tempted to just read you this sermon, tell you that it was his, but I, I did not. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 to 25. Uh, Paul has, has not quite finished but he's finished starting to reprove the Corinthian Christians for their divisions. And he reminds them that neither he nor Apollos nor Peter were crucified for the Corinthians. And that none of them were baptized in his name. And he thanks God that, that in his providence, right, even very few of them were baptized by Paul, much less in his name. And now he reminds them of the true grounds of their unity. They're united in the person of Jesus Christ and through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is, it is to that gospel and the preaching of that gospel as the matter of first importance that Paul turns his attention before we read the text, please pray with me. Now, Father, we are like those when the summer fruit has been gathered and the grapes have been gleaned, where there is no cluster to eat and no first ripe fig, first ripe fig to refresh our souls. It seems like the godly have perished from the earth. There is no one upright among the rulers of mankind that all lie in wait for blood and each hunts the other with a net. That the very best of men are like briars and thorn hedges. Princes and judges ask and work for bribes. Great men utter the evil desires of their souls. Sons treat their fathers with contempt. Daughters rise up against mothers. Daughter-in-laws against mothers-in-law. And a man's, man's enemies are those of his household. Lord, there is no one to whom we can look Besides you, we wait for the God of our salvation. We know that you will hear us. That you will 
be a light to us. That you will plead our cause and execute judgment for us. Not because we are sinless, for we have sinned against you. But because you are gracious and merciful to us. Lord, you will vindicate yourself and your word. You will triumph over your foes. And men and women will come to you in repentance and faith from the ends of the earth. There is no God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression. No God like you who does not retain anger forever, but delights in steadfast love. You will have compassion on us, and you will cast our sins into the depths of the sea, as you have sworn from days of old. Lord, protect us from seeking salvation anywhere other than your promises. Help us to comprehend the glory of your gospel. And to be satisfied in it alone. We ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 1 Corinthians 1, 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This is the word of our Lord. So, Paul reveals to us here that his primary purpose in Corinth was not to baptize. The church was commanded to go and baptize. But it's not Paul's primary purpose, and it is not the primary purpose of the church. This, this purpose was not unique to Paul. This purpose to preach was the primary purpose of, of each of the apostles and each of the evangelists, and each of the shepherds and teachers that God would give to the churches throughout the world. It's the primary purpose of the church in the world to preach the gospel. It's through preaching the gospel that the church is, as 1 Timothy 3.15 states, the pillar and buttress of the truth. Now, again, preaching the gospel is not the only purpose of the church. The church must observe the ordinances properly. It must baptize and it must celebrate the Lord's Supper. The, the church must encourage its members in the faith. The church must seek to do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. The, the church must pray and the church must sing. But above all else, the church exists to preach, to proclaim the truth of the gospel. It's through the gospel that sinners are brought to faith, to repentance and renewal, regeneration and eternal life. And it's through the preaching of that gospel that the gospel is most clearly expressed and communicated to sinners. As, as we uh, read and discussed this morning in our catechism, right? it's 
through the preaching of the gospel is one of the main methods that the church exercises the keys of the kingdom, opens the doors to heaven to its hearers. The church exists for preaching, but preaching must be done properly. And in, of all the, the grievous perversions of this sinful world, the way humanity has taken so many good things and twisted them to evil ends, the perversion of preaching must be very near the worst of them. There are at least two ways in which gospel preaching can be perverted. The first, the more obvious, is when we change the substance of the message. As, as verse 23 states, we preach Christ crucified. If we preach anything other than Christ crucified, it is not gospel preaching. Pastor H.B. Charles told a story uh, about a, a church, large church with a, with a fancy building, pillars on the way in, and, and a, and a um, colonnade and on the front over the doors into the church said we preach Christ crucified and over over the years um, ivy began to grow on the sides of the church it's nice pretty ivy so they let it grow um, like Ridley Field but the ivy began to grow around the you know they kept the doorway clear but it started to grow over the top of the doorway and so over the years we preach Christ crucified was, was covered up and it became just we preach Christ and then over more years, it became just, we preach. And then over even more years, it just became, we. And the church exists because there are people who like gathering together to do all sorts of things other than preaching Christ crucified. And it's not about the significance of the words over the door. It's, it's reflective of the heart of the church. So many churches that began for the purpose of preaching Christ crucified over years have shifted from the truth of the gospel. They begin to preach a different gospel. And then they begin to preach no gospel at all. And they become no church at all. Charles Spurgeon, I did quote him at length here, um, on, on his sermon on this topic, said, before I enter upon our text, let me very briefly tell you what I believe preaching Christ and Him crucified is. My friends, I do not believe it is preaching Christ and Him crucified to give our people a batch of philosophy every Sunday morning and evening and neglect the truth of this holy book. I do not believe it is preaching Christ and Him crucified to leave out the main cardinal doctrines of the Word of God and preach a religion which is all mist and haze without any definite truths, whatever. I take it that man does not preach Christ and Him crucified who can get through a sermon without mentioning Christ's name once. Nor does that man preach Christ and Him crucified who leaves out the Holy Spirit's work, who never says a word about the Holy Ghost, so that indeed the hearers might say, we do not so much as know whether there is a Holy Ghost. And I have my own private opinion that there is no such thing as preaching Christ and Him crucified unless you preach what nowadays is called Calvinism. I have my own ideas, and those I always state boldly. It is a nickname to call it Calvinism. Calvinism is the gospel and nothing else. I do not believe we can preach the gospel if we do not preach justification by faith without works, nor unless we preach the sovereignty of God and His dispensation of grace, nor unless we exalt the electing, unchangeable, eternal, immutable, conquering love of Jehovah. Nor do I think we can preach the gospel unless we base it upon the peculiar redemption which Christ made for His elect and chosen people. Nor can I comprehend a gospel which lets saints fall away after they are called and suffers the children of God to be burned in the fires of damnation after having believed. Such a gospel I abhor. The gospel of the Bible is not such a gospel as that. 
We preach Christ and Him crucified in a different fashion. And to all gainsayers we reply, we have not so learned Christ. And I agree with Spurgeon. And practical preaching is not gospel preaching. Sermons about how to live your best life now, and 12 steps to a successful marriage, and 5 keys to winning at work, and 7 steps to financial peace, and, and so forth. Sermons which treat the Bible as though it were merely a self-help guide are not worthy of the church, nor worthy of its head, Jesus Christ. Now yes, the Bible tells us how we ought to live as husband and wife. The Bible tells us how we ought to behave when we work in the service of another. It tells us how we ought to steward our resources. But it doesn't tell us those things in order that we might be successful in them. It tells us how to honor our Savior in them. And we obey Scripture not to be successful, not to be comfortable, not to be content and satisfied in this world, but in order to be obedient and well-pleasing to our crucified and risen Lord. The church exists to preach Christ crucified and nothing else. The entire canon of Scripture, from the first words of Genesis to the closing words of Revelation, all exist to bear witness to Christ crucified. To tell us why and how and to what purpose he was crucified. And how we should live in the light of his death and resurrection. And any church that forsakes this preaching has become worthless. Whatever else it might be doing. But there's a second danger of perverting gospel preaching. It's more subtle and it's perhaps more dangerous. And that is in preaching, it's this perversion that often leads eventually to the first, it's a preaching that depends upon eloquent wisdom. The, the New American Standard translates it as cleverness of words. Eloquence or rhetorical skill and worldly wisdom were of supreme importance to the Greeks. In the ancient Greek world, I mean, they didn't even really distinguish between, between rhetoric and wisdom until Aristotle. Um, prior to that, wisdom was rhetoric, and rhetoric was the application of wisdom in speaking. And even in Aristotle, they're very closely linked together. So 400 years before Paul preached in, in Corinth, this trio of Greek philosophers, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, each one the student of the one preceding, had, had changed the world through their pursuit of wisdom. There were philosophers, lovers of wisdom, before Socrates, and there were philosophers after Aristotle. And they thought, and they spoke, and they debated, and they taught others how to think and how to debate. And even 400 years after Aristotle, almost 400 years after Aristotle, Luke would describe the atmosphere of Athens in these words in Acts 17, 21. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Looks at the, the entire population of Athens thought themselves to be philosophers. And the only way they, they ever wanted to spend their time was, was seeking wisdom through speaking and hearing of new ideas, logically arranged and eloquently expressed. And, and while this ideal was certainly concentrated in Athens, it, it existed throughout all of Greece. And it has hugely influenced all the Western world from their days even until now. Today we don't have many people who think themselves to be philosophers, but nearly everyone lives upon the basis of, of the unquestioned assumptions they have inherited from Western philosophy. Now there was one particular group of Greek philosophers who were called sophists. Uh, they called themselves the wise men. Socrates would have called them the wise guys. Uh, he did not think very highly of these sophists. 
But they used their wisdom and their education, particularly in the realm of rhetoric, to win debates and persuade others to their point of view. And they didn't really care which side of the debate they ended up taking. They, they could argue either side and do it very well because they knew the art of rhetoric. It's like a modern debating club where you get assigned which side of the issue you're going to defend and you just have to do your best with that side. And they taught others to do the same as them. Their, their techniques became the standards for debate and public speaking throughout all the Greek-speaking world. And, and it was considered the height of skill and virtue to be an eloquent public speaker and to be able to persuade others to your view. But Paul utterly rejected this as incompatible with the gospel. Paul insists that gospel preaching should not be with eloquent wisdom because such wisdom empties the cross of its power. And sadly, there are many preachers today who are otherwise orthodox who side with the sophists over Paul and they embrace eloquent wisdom. It's this mindset of sophistry that leads preachers to plagiarize the sermons of others or to purchase pre-written sermon outlines or plans or even whole sermon manuscripts. Sophism that fuels so much of the rise of megachurches and the church growth mindset that large crowds must be gathered together and persuaded by the power, by the eloquence of the preacher's words. Alright, that's... That's the temptation to read one of Spurgeon's sermons and, and just copy because he's more eloquent than I can be. And it's what leads preachers today to, to just buy or steal the sermons from people pastoring larger churches. Well, whatever they're saying must be working to gather a crowd. So let me just borrow their words. Now, why, why do they do it? They do it because it works. Why does Paul forbid it? Paul forbids it because it doesn't work. And how, how can both of those things be true? It's because they're pursuing different goals. Those sophists, both old and new, those who rely upon eloquent wisdom, seek to fill buildings to attract followers and to fill their pockets. And their techniques work wonderfully to that end. But Paul sought the salvation of sinners and the glory of their Savior. Eloquent wisdom attracts people and it draws crowds and it can produce an external and superficial appearance of salvation. but it's the foolishness of preaching that saves sinners. And we, see, we can see both of these truths in, in the life of one man, George Whitfield. George Whitfield was quite possibly, almost certainly, the most eloquent speaker to ever use the English language. He attracted crowds of tens of thousands of people in the mid-1700s. He spoke to tens of thousands of people at once by the power of his voice. There are accounts of farmers hearing that George Whitfield is going to be preaching in the town, 10 and 15 and 20 miles away from their farm. And, and the farmer would immediately throw his wife onto the horse and run into town just to hear this man preach. He, he preached in Philadelphia to more than twice the population of Philadelphia at, at one time. And Benjamin Franklin, who lived in Philadelphia, loved to hear George Whitfield preach. Benjamin Franklin was, was not a Christian. He, he wasn't even a deist. He was decidedly agnostic. But he loved to hear Whitfield preach, and he eagerly printed Whitfield's sermons and tracts and distributed them 
and sold them. And he was even moved to donate his own personal money to the support of the orphanage that Whitfield had started in Georgia. He, he was moved by the eloquence of Whitfield. But he rejected the gospel that Whitfield preached. There, there were many who were converted under Whitfield's preaching. But there were many more who came simply for the pleasure of hearing him speak. One critic remarked of Whitfield that he could move men to tears simply by his pronunciation of the word Mesopotamia. And I can't imagine how that's possible. I've fought through every way I could possibly pronounce Mesopotamia, and none of them moved me or anyone else to tears. Many came in just, just for the eloquence that he had. And, and there are preachers with a, a not to the same degree, but with similar gifts today. Uh, I've heard more than one person remark that they could gladly just sit and listen to Alistair Begg read a phone book. Right? He, he has this wonderful Scottish accent and lilt, and it's, it is pleasant to listen to. But the true success that Whitfield had was revealed by another critic uh, who, who was not nearly so positive about Whitfield. Had nothing positive to say about Whitfield. And his remarks were that George Whitfield's ideas are few, they're bluntly put, and they're endlessly repeated. That's all he is. While, while Whitfield's voice was magnificent, his words were not impressive to the cultured elites of America or England. He was despised by the hierarchy of the Anglican Church, and he was dismissed by the intellectual rationalists of both continents. His preaching was old-fashioned and primitive and superstitious and foolish. It might be pleasing to listen to, but to many of his hearers, the message was considered no more significant than, than listening to, to Benedict Cumberbatch or some other actor reciting poetry today. You, you might enjoy it, but it's not going to change your life. Whitfield's eloquence drew crowds, but it was the folly of his preaching that the Lord used to save souls. And far too many preachers today have chosen to seek to imitate his eloquence rather than his simplicity. Now, on the, we need to understand, it's not, it's not that the presence of eloquence itself is, is wrong. Right? If you have a beautiful voice, you don't need to try to adopt a nasal twang to make your preaching seem less attractive. If you have a gift for putting together well-ordered outlines and presentations, you don't have to make it haphazard and, and sloppy and less clear. Right? It's, it's about the substance. It always ultimately comes down to the substance of the message. Because verse 18 makes it very clear that the true gospel message will always be regarded as folly to those who are perishing. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Those who reject the truth of the gospel, those who refuse to repent and believe, will always despise the gospel and those who cling to it. We, will be, we who are being saved will be regarded as superstitious simpletons, as biblical bigots, as religious radicals, because we hold to the word of the cross. And, and many desiring to be accepted by the rest of the world have, have therefore altered and changed and watered down the content of the message until the world stops despising them, until this message becomes acceptable to them. But by so doing, by adopting the wisdom of the world, they gain the approval of the world, but they empty the cross of its power. 
But God promises in verse 19 that he will destroy the wisdom of the wise and thwart the discernment of the discerning. And in verse 20, God declares that he has made foolish the wisdom of the world. So when Paul asks, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? He's not asking, well, hey, where's, where are the philosophers of Corinth? I can't find them anywhere. So he's making a point that none of them, the wise, the scribes, the debaters, have nothing to offer compared to the gospel message. They cannot improve upon it. They cannot defend against it. All their wisdom and all their eloquence is useless compared to the simple truth of the gospel. And the reason is in verse 21. Because, or since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. The world does not and cannot know God through wisdom. Natural theology, a theology based upon observing the created world and observing human nature and reflecting carefully and precisely and thoroughly on those things, cannot, cannot bring us to Christ. It can make us seem wise to the world. It can make us seem impressive. But all the wisdom of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle together cannot bring us to a knowledge of God. And when men like Thomas Aquinas attempted to use the logic and the wisdom of Aristotle in order to write a systematic theology, summa theologica, all theology, it, it can produce results that seem very impressive to the world. But where it follows worldly wisdom, it departs from the truth. It becomes empty of its power. Only the gospel of Christ crucified can bring us to a knowledge of God, can bring us to faith and salvation and communion with God. And this gospel was and remains to this day a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. It's a stumbling block to all those who rely upon the formalism of their piety and their religion. Those whose religion consists of doing the right things and behaving the right ways and even believing the right things, but has no place for an absolute dependence upon a Savior who dies for the sins of His people and who gives His people His own righteousness because they have none of their own. So the Jews sought to establish their own righteousness. And they rejected the righteous one. And so the Jews demand sign after sign after sign, and they're never satisfied because they refuse to surrender their self dependent religiosity. How many times in the Gospels did the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to Jesus seeking a sign from heaven to test him? What other signs did they need? So many of them are recorded in, in Scripture. We have the sick being healed. We have demons being cast out. We have the lame walking, the blind receiving their sight, the dead being raised. We have a voice coming down from heaven declaring, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. As the Holy Spirit descends upon him in the visible form of a dove, and they still said, we need a sign. Give us a sign. They didn't need a sign. They were seeking excuses to avoid this stumbling block of an absolute dependence upon the grace of God. 
many continue to stumble over the gospel because it, it removes from their hands all control and authority and personal determinism. But we must not change the gospel to remove this stumbling block. We, we must not dare to teach people the lie that their salvation is, is somehow within their own power to achieve. It's only the truth can save. And, and in the same similar manner, the, the gospel of Christ is folly to the Gentiles, to the Greeks, with all their wisdom and all their philosophy. To their refined minds, it was utter foolishness for a God to need to die for the sake of his people. For sins to need to be punished at all. For wrath to be eternal. Or for forgiveness to be attainable simply through repentance and faith. For centuries, many have derided the gospel as a moral monstrosity. Calling it cosmic child abuse. Calling it old-fashioned superstition entirely out of place with the modern world. They'll say that surely what, what makes sense in our wisdom is simply for this God to inform his creation of how they should live, perhaps give them a little bit of help to live that way, and then if he wants to be gracious, he can accept those who do their best to live up to his standard. And surely God's standard of, of what is good has to be conformed to our internal notions of what's right and wrong. And when God's word contradicts what I feel to be true, well, then surely I'm right. And the Bible, I mean, really, it's a very nice attempt at a moral philosophy, but it was written by these ignorant and uneducated non-philosopher, fishermen, shepherds, ancient tribal people. And they did the best they could. To them, the gospel's full foolish. To them, we are foolish, and, and will always be, not merely foolish, but fools. And so it has always been, and so it will always be. Those who are perishing, those who reject the gospel, will never be on truly good terms with us who are being saved. At best, they will give us this patronizing approval and pat us on the heads and, and say, well, they're, they're nice enough people, even though they have such silly ideas. And when we begin to seek after the world's approval, then, then we become worthy of such patronization. Because we're abandoning the truth to gain the approval of those who are doomed to be destroyed. Rather, let them think us fools. Let them dismiss us as fanatics. We seek not the approval of man, but of God. And it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Because the foolishness of God, verse 25, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. What could be more foolish than sending your beloved son into a world that you know will hate him and reject him and execute him. What could be more foolish than to send your son into the world that you know is going to accuse him of being out of his mind and demon-possessed? And what could be more foolish than sending your son to preach a message that, that you know nearly everyone is going to despise and reject. And what could be weaker than a king crucified by his own people? What could be weaker than a savior unable to deliver himself from a cross? What could be weaker than a liberator who announced that he came to set captives free, who could not, not escape the hands of the Roman oppressors? What could be weaker than a man who died forsaken by his friends and at the mercy of his foes? And yet, through the foolishness of God, he has accomplished a salvation that could never have been reached through all the wisdom of the world. 
and through the weakness of God, he won a victory that could never have been achieved through all the force of the world. Sin and death have been defeated in Jesus Christ. And those who believe are assured of eternal life. To the Jews and Greeks, the gospel of Jesus Christ, of Christ crucified, is a stumbling block in foolishness. But to those who are called, to us who are being saved, those called from among every people and nation and tongue and tribe, Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God. And so let us cling unashamedly to the despised truths of the gospel. That God created the world good. And that it was the rebellion of our first parents that introduced sin and suffering and death into the world. And separated us from our creator. That each one of us is guilty of willfully participating and furthering their rebellion against God. Through our own sinful actions. That because of our rebellion against God, we deserve to die and to suffer eternally in hell. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. The Father sent his Son, very God of very God, into the world to dwell among us. He took on flesh, he was born of the Virgin Mary, and he lived for three decades a sinless and perfect human life. He preached the truth of the kingdom of God, he healed the sick, he cast out demons, and he raised the dead. He called the weary and heavy laden to come to him and promised that he would give them rest. And the chief priests and the scribes hated him. They had him arrested and tried and convicted and executed. And at his trial, he refused to speak in his own defense. Socrates is, is remembered today only because of Plato's account of the eloquence of Socrates' defense at his trial, which did result in his execution. Socrates, in his wisdom, said everything he could within the bounds of his philosophy to save his life. Jesus said not a word. He refused to exercise his power or his authority to deliver himself. Jesus died because he allowed himself to be killed. And as he suffered upon a Roman cross, he took upon himself all the sins, all the wicked rebelliousness of all his people. He suffered in the place of his people. He bore the full penalty of the guilt of sin. And he died and was buried and on the third day rose again. And he offers eternal life to everyone who will repent and believe in this good news. He doesn't just offer to wipe the slate clean and give you a second chance to do better this time. He doesn't just offer you instructions on how you can live a better life from this time forward. He offers you his own righteousness, his own life. He promises you that you can be united with him and through him enter into eternal life and joy. And this is and will always be folly to the world. They, they will always say, with good reason, that our ideas are few and bluntly put and endlessly repeated. But to us who are being saved, this is the power of God. Believe it, cling to it, and proclaim it for the salvation of souls.
Lord, we are amazed at the foolishness and the wisdom of the gospel, at the weakness and the strength of the gospel, that Jesus should be come flesh and be crucified and dead and buried and then be found the tomb be found empty and you risen as the gospels bear witness as witnesses prove and as our hearts know so we ask that you would allow us to die with you that we might rise to a new life we desire to be dead and buried to sin and selfishness and the world that we might not be distracted or intimidated or persuaded by the lies of the world, that we might be delivered from the lusts of the world. Lord, crucify our sinful nature. Put it to death. Deliver us from the fear of man and the love of praise and the shame of being thought foolish or old-fashioned the desire to be cultivated or modern or sophisticated. Let us count our old lives dead because of the crucifixion. And may we never seek to revive it again. May we stand with our dying Savior. May we be content to be rejected. May we be willing to take up unpopular truths and hold fast to despised teachings even until death. Help us to be resolute and Christ-contained. Keep us on the paths of obedience to your will. Strengthen us for the battles ahead. Give us joy for the trials. And give us grace for the joys. Help us to be holy, happy people. Free us from every wrong desire. Free us from everything opposed to your will. Grant us more and more of the resurrection life. May it rule over us. May we walk in its power. May we be strengthened through its influence. Your foolishness is wiser than men. And your weakness is stronger than men. May we rest in this truth and pray. In your name, Jesus the Christ. Amen.